Ocala's information station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Five minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Robin, I trained for this position. <laughs> I, tr- I went to, well, I didn't go to school for this, but I but I read books. I learned. I had to take a test with the FCC. Yes, right? you did. And, and then when I, find, when I finally got hired at a radio station, I, I learned the skills because I was kind of interested in, in music and recording. So I had I had a great background in, in reel-to-reel tapes and how to edit tapes and cut them and make sound and, and do all of those things. And none of those skills are necessary anymore. No. Nothing. Nothing that I learned back nothing. then is necessary anymore. <laughs> uh, and, and, and why is that? Because change happened. When, uh, if you were to take a time machine and see us working uh, back in the, I guess, the mid to late 80s is when we first started working together. Um, we had tape recorders besides us. We had a record player. Yeah. I guess we tur- we called it a turntable, right? Yes. It, it, made it, it made it seem a little bit more important. It's not a record player. It's a turntable. <laughs> Right? That's right. And and then things changed. Uh, CD players. We don't even have a CD player in here anymore. No. I don't think we need one All anymore. gone. Uh, it's just amazing. How, and we were talking to some filmmakers last week. And f- that, that film that they're going to show at the drive-in tomorrow uh-huh. is not on a reel. There's no movie like we like we know with uh, what's it called? Uh, what's that product? What's the plastic called? Acetate or something? Yes, acetate. But anyway, the point is that things change. Now, I have, be, uh, in, in the course of my lifetime, I've had the position of being both in management and being, you know, one of the flunkies. And, w- and when you're a flunky and the management says, well, we got some big changes in the head, uh, you know, the, the grumbling from underneath is like, <laughs> why fix what's not broken? How come we're fixing something that's not broken? <laughs> yeah. And, of course, we don't see the big picture when we're at that level because we're little guppies and, and, the, sh- mm-hmm. and the sharks, of course, are in charge. Uh, change is an important and inevitable thing. Not only is that, but learning how, if you are a manager especially, to make those little guppies <laughs> <laughs> change change with more... Hmm, I mean, just to go along with it a little bit better, to, to understand why we're doing what we're doing and the changes that are taking place, um, sometimes just requires some... Lack of ignorance. That's what I'm going to call it. Lack mm-hmm. of ignorance. You might call it intelligence. In fact, our next guest does. Uh, she's Barbara A. Troutline. I should say Dr. Barbara Troutline. She's a Ph.D. She's got a, 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 she is a change leadership consultant, an inspirational speaker for Fortune 50 companies. The other 450 we'll talk about another day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and she's a researcher. Her book is awesome. And, and some very insightful thoughts in the book about change and how... I don't know, maybe just if you're the father of a family or the mother of a family and you're trying to tell the kids we're going to move, you know, or we're going to change schools or we're going to you're going to make we're going to have you li- you know what that bedroom that's been yours all this time, that's going to be your new sister's. We're going to move you over to the other side of the house. Right. You know, and, and how to handle those kind of changes. Change Intelligence is the name of her book. Use the power of CQ, which she is coined uh to lead change that sticks is the title of the book. I mean, the uh, subtitle of the book. Dr. Barbara A. Troutland. Good morning, Barbara. Hi. Thanks for having me, Larry and Robin. And what's it, let's see. I heard you talking to Robin. Did I say? Did I hear you say you were in Chicago? Yes, the suburb of Chicago. Okay. Well, thank you for being on the air, getting up a little bit early to be with us this morning. Yeah, that's, no worries. It's an interesting thing. I mean, change is inevitable. I mean, look at look at newspapers. What have they had to go through, right? Absolutely, that's right. Yeah, and just a quick story to build on your story before about the uh, all the changes your industry has seen, uh-huh. um, and and dealing with kids and moving and that sort of thing. Uh, one of my buddies was cleaning out his basement, and his little son was there, and his and he came across his old albums, and he had to explain to his son what albums were, and the boy got very quiet. He said, "But daddy, how did you play that in the car?" <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. I, I, oh, that's my. Right. So well, I, I, I'm old enough wow. to remember. Tr- I remember trying to figure out how am I going to play records in the car before <laughs> exactly. be- before there was before the 8-track tape player, right? <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. So changes. And that's 
you know, and that's why I wrote the book, Change Intelligence, because we think because we're bombarded with change in all aspects of our lives that we know how to deal with it, and we know how stressful it can be. And to your point, when we become leaders in organizations, whether it's in the C-suite or the front line, we just don't get the training and the tools to really know how to do it, but yet that's a key part of our expectation. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, so, so is it from a psychological perspective that, that you're helping us better understand? And, and this is more for guiding we if we let me ask you this how do i ask you this let's say we're the one in charge and we're the one reluctant to change change needs to happen i mean we got iphones and ipads and all that kind of stuff and we need to start using them do 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 we convince ourselves that we need to use them or do we really need to use them that's that's a brilliant comment because so often what happens is you know you just talked about the sharks and the guppies um and change looks very different at different levels of the hierarchy if you're at the top you are the one who understands why you need to use the smartphone and you need to mm -hmm. transition to this new way of working and new strategy and new location or whatever it is. You see it. You see that big picture. You see the competitive pressures. But at the same time, you tend to be most isolated from what the change really requires on the front lines. Oh, gosh. So good point. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so therefore the people at the front lines, they look most resistant because they're the ones who really need to change in a very fundamental way what they're doing. And to your point, those poor people in the middle, the supervisors, the managers at all different levels, they tend to be squeezed. So they get these edicts from the top that they often don't understand clearly or buy into themselves, and they get very legitimate real-world pushback from the people below them. So they're very squeezed, and it's a very tough position to be in. And that's where the book comes in, isn't it? Exactly. That's uh, right. That's okay. right. So do, do we give the book to the employees, or do we give the book to the managers, or both? That's great. You know, it's really targeted towards the managers, towards the leader of change. And at the same time, what I talk about in the book is building the change intelligence of an organization. So it's really looking at, you know, as you probably know your IQ, whether we want to admit it or not, right? right, <laughs> and, uh, right. And, and these days we've all heard of EQ or emotional intelligence and how important it is for us to understand and manage our, our own emotions and be able to build relationships with other people. But we really don't talk about or help people build their CQ. So when we do that, all levels are able to work together much more effectively. And when, like you said, people on the front line understand what change intelligence is, they're much better able to communicate to their leaders what they really need and what's missing to make change happen. I uh, like how you address the seasonal business and how you address the attitudes of the employees that are there full-time, that those particular full-time employees view the part-time seasonal employees as a nuisance because they don't know what's going on in the business and they have to be trained. Exactly. So that's right. So the situation, the case, my book is mostly case studies. And so the case that Robin's referring to is a company that their business, like she just said, is very seasonal. So what they do is they ramp up with temporary workers for half the year. And, and it can be very challenging for the folks who that's their full-time job because now in addition to doing all the work that they need to do on the production lines, they're now having to um, observe and train and keep safe these new folks. And so, again, if you're not all aligned about what the business benefit is to doing that, what the benefit to yourself is, if you don't feel like you have the training and the tools to do it, there could just be fear, and that could be what looks like resistance. We are basically talking about orchestrated or designed change. In other words, somebody along the way has said, hmm, I went to a seminar, and this is how they're doing it in, in Indiana, and maybe we should do it this way here or something like that, and here's what we need to do. That's one kind of change where it's orchestrated and planned, to des designed. But there's also the sudden change, the, the tsunami that hit Japan or, or um, the, the Katrina. This, so all of a sudden, your life has changed. A spouse dies. All of a sudden, the instant change that you didn't expect or didn't see coming. Does the book address that as well? And, and is our change uh, intelligence, uh, if we improve that, will it help there? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, um, anyone who's worked in organizations for any period of time, um, we know that what looks like planful change maybe not isn't as planned as, as well as, and thoughtfully as, uh -huh. as we would hope all the time. Yeah. So um, a lot of times we know it, it's just announced and it doesn't seem as, as well thought out or, or structured or um, intelligent as we might hope. So definitely once people build their individual change intelligence, because that's my, that's my point with the book is that 
Um, there's lots of studies that show that for the last several decades, the rate of failure for major organizational changes is hovering around 70%. The needle has not moved. And so why is that? Hmm. And my contention is it's often a failure of leadership, and it's a failure of leadership to look within, start within themselves, instead of having the focus be focusing on other people and doing something to them or even in spite of them, what are we doing to understand how we're leading the change? And that could be the sudden change, the tsunami, like you just said. It could be an incremental change transformational change, but whatever it is, if we, just like when we build, build our IQ or, or EQ, it helps us in all situations, life, family, yeah. professional, yeah. Um, the same thing with CQ. Yeah, and when, and when September 11th, 2001 happened, everybody was saying the world has changed on this day, and well, I don't know that I saw it right away. I mean, I, I remember hearing that phrase a lot, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess we do know what changes took place, but the guy who was the leader that day, at least for, for appearances sake anyway, was Mayor Giuliani of New York. I mean, he took on that leadership role, even if he wasn't the one calling all the shots and making all the decisions, he was the one everybody was looking to for strength because I guess he exhibited it. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, and I'm from New York. I was born in Yonkers and I grew up on Long Island. And so my uh, two best high school friends, a woman, she was a uh, New York City policeman in Manhattan that day, and my best guy friend was a fireman. So oh, wow. I saw and heard about it, you know, like, almost like I was there. And the day after it happened, I actually was at a BP refinery in Whiting, Indiana, and so the change was immediate in terms of the security um, and all the, you know, so you talk about a tsunami, one of the major refineries in the country, of course, um, potential terrorist target and so immediately the changes that they needed to make it was um, pretty astounding oh wow um, you address the different personalities of the hierarchy and the workers in your book I mean you really uh, take them step by step and define each like the adapter uh, the uh, facilitator the champion and I think that's really great that you are pointing that out so people that aren't that way can recognize there are people that are that way and make your business more successful. Yeah, thanks for saying that because so often what looks like very challenging behaviors in other people is because really what they're doing is they're trying their best to lead the change in the ways that they know how. They're trying to leverage their strengths, but it's just very opposite or alien to our way of thinking. So if we can just understand to your point that there are different ways that people lead change, and we can actually learn from that, and we can partner with people who are different than us. So for example, I use myself as, a, as an example in the book, and I'm a champion change leader style. So I tend to lead with looking at both the big picture, where are we going, and then working with the people to get there. So championing, inspiring, all that good stuff. Um, the opposite of my style is called the executor. Those are folks who are very planful, very systematic. Um, and I am not that way at all, but my co-facilitator is somebody who will dot all the I's, cross all the T's, have multicolored spreadsheets, never let anything drop through the cracks. So they're much more detail-oriented with me. So it's a great partnership. Yeah. So, of course, we could drive each other crazy because of our very you know, different st work styles on preferences. But instead, we, we appreciate that. We know we have good intentions, and we use it to strengthen our partnership. You know, we uh, had a chief of police here in our town who used to be, I don't know if he was a chief of police in Miami, but he, had, he was one of the higher upper, upper high guys in the Miami Police Department. Yeah, anyway, he told, us, he told us a story that, I, I wanted to, that you reminded me of, when you talk, especially when, in the part of the book when you're talking about the champion um, of changes. They had, they had a battle, I guess, against gangs down in Miami or something like mm -hmm. this. So they decided to find out who the leaders were of each of the gangs, kind of identify the you know, the head guy, you know, the, the alpha male, whatever, okay? Yeah. And, and they would actually get these guys into the police department and try to talk to them to make them understand that they were now in charge of making their neighborhood a better neighborhood. So suddenly they had this task handed down to them from an elected official, or I guess a police chief was elected, but the point is they had this task and... It was almost like uh, I don't know. I don't want to go overboard here, but it's almost like God pointed to Moses. All right, you're, you're the one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And and I think that that you you hit on something really important that they must have hit on also, in order to recognize the people who will affect the people who will affect the people. It's kind of like a little um, trickle down thing or something. 
Yeah, we always talk about opinion leaders in change, and we always talk about early adopters. So that's not necessarily the people who have the formal position in the hierarchy, right? Yeah, right. But they're the people that others really look to and respect. And, um, and they are great to leverage in times of change because, again, people do look to them. And the other thing that your example points out is the psychological truism that we know in my field, and you can see that over and over again, is that participation leads to ownership. So, so often it's, it's, again, if you picture a triangle, right, you know, for example, with the police, right, it could be the police at one angle, the gang members at the other, and gang violence at the third point of the triangle. And so often... You know, a group like the police or leaders at the top of a corporation trying to affect change see themselves as against the people, in this case the cops against the gang members, as well as against the problem, which is gang violence. And what they did was brilliant because they changed their mindset, they changed their behaviors, they focused on partnering with the gang leaders to all attempt to eradicate the violence. So again, it's much less like pushing the less like pushing the string it's much less exhausting you created a partner in this they have accountability and ownership and you have a much higher both probability of success but why is that also because you are really coming up with solutions that are targeted at the problem because the people who are involved are telling you what it is it's not you assuming yeah right right and and you talk about uh, blind spots in your book and you and and you say that uh, people will people in leadership roles will use them as a form of denial that something isn't going quite right Right, absolutely. So um, two ways to look at that. One, we often talk about in change, just like when people get um, in, uh, encountered with change for the first time, especially if it's a major change, it's often like what, we ha- what happens when we, get encountered, we encounter death or, or some serious illness, that a lot of times first we go into denial. Um, so we just can't believe it's happening. We say, oh, it's just a program of the year or there's manager in this too shall pass, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so we deny and, and we, don't, um, we don't behave consistently with the change. We just kind of put our heads in the same. Um, so so that, that is one thing that, that people tend to do. And so what leaders can do is, what can they do? Well, they can do things to help demonstrate to people that things are changing. And here is why. Mm-hmm. And here is what we expect from you and what we need from you. And, and what do you need from us? And what are the, um, w- what are the things you're thinking about? Um, so, again, what can leaders do to help move past that denial stage so people really begin to understand and then eventually accept the change. What I like about this philosophy is that you could use it in the microcosmic world, like a little, you know, mom and pop business. You could use it on the whole planet. I mean, if we could, if we could get the, the gangs of the world, si- similar to the gangs of Miami, but I mean, the gangs of the world are huge. I mean, it, it's it's North Korea and it's it's uh, mm-hmm. it's the people in the Middle East who insist on keep bombing each other. If we could figure out a way uh, to, I, I guess, incorporate this. Uh, what you're talking about in the book in change intelligence, it just, I mean, I don't want to be too too optimistic, but it could be the beginning of, of perhaps world peace. Um, Barbara H. Troutline is our guest, and she has written this wonderful book. It's called Change Intelligence. Use the power of CQ, which stands for change intelligence, to lead change that sticks. And the sticking part is important. And, and going back to our own experience with the changes that took place in, in um, the technology used in radio, I mean, how many, uh, you know, for a while there, just so you know this, uh, Barbara, we had in the studio, we still had some of the old realtor, uh, well, we had cartridge Kurtz. machines. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, well. And, and I, I was the one who said, don't take them out. We ne- you never know. We might still need them. Great. <laughs> but they're not here anymore. Somebody said, you know what? I take them out. Larry will never use them again. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, of the mo- well, one of the hardest things that the CEO of a company can do, whether it's got uh, five employees or uh, maybe a thousand, is to be a parent because that CEO wants to be their friend. But at the same time, you can't be a friend and a parent at the same time. Right, and that's one of the hardest transitions, <clears throat> excuse me, for leaders to make when they step up to leadership is that balance of friendliness and formality. And um, so, and that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things we could say about that, and that's why in my book I talked about leaders at different levels. So I talk about frontline leaders, supervisors who are stepping up to their first leadership role, uh, project managers who are in a different kind of situation because they have authority to lead the team, but they might not have everyone on the team reporting to them full time. 
So then they have to negotiate with the people's bosses, with their other workload. It's a very challenging position. Ramp up and become friendly with them quickly, but then hold them accountable to typically pretty demanding project timeline and budget. And then there's folks at the sea level, which is challenging as well, especially with the turnover at the sea level and you know needing to come in and prove yourself right away and make some big changes to you know improve your competitive position, your stock price. But at the same time, you need to build a team within the organization and have people rally behind you and a lot of things you're asking them to do are very challenging and very new and different. So that's right, at any level it's, it's a struggle with um, and that's why, you know, to your point about the, the, the gangs and it, it's so important to simultaneously show people the why and so my model talks about the head, heart and hand, so show people the why of the change, deal with the head, the strategy, the vision, the rationale also, though, you have to deal with the heart. You have to build relationships. You have to engage people, communicate, deal with their fears, build trust, show your vulnerability like a good parent. And the hand, so often it looks like resistance, is that people, they might get it, they might want it, but they just don't know how to do it. And so often in our cost-pressured world and time-pressured world, we don't take the time to really train people, to really give them the tactics and the plan and the tools, overcome barriers to behave consistently with the change. Uh, the, the change we're talking about, um, would it include, let's say I go to the doctor, the doctor says, Larry, you got to change your lifestyle. And he gives me, and he gives me some great imp- great changes I need to make, like yeah. <laughs> you know you need to sleep more or something, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, or or eat less or something like that. I mean, you know, I, I have a little personal uh, story to tell you. When I had, I, I don't have a cat anymore. My cat has died. But when I had a cat and a dog, I, I uh, kind of, in a humorous way, I guess, r- discovered that cats hate change. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> do- <laughs> dogs, dogs are. Okay. You move your furniture around. The dog will say, okay, I'll sleep over here now. The cat comes into the house and says, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. What's going on here? This isn't what a place I remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they have a very hard time with change. Well, well you made the mistake to think it's your house and not the cat. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> and that is I have a, a cat, too. <laughs> but that is an extremely interesting point because a uh, business is not just the house of the executives at large. It's the house of every employee from the janitor all the way up. Well, that's right, and that's one of my uh, case studies in the book also is about um, a global pharmaceutical firm that I was working with that they wanted to move to a lean manufacturing approach, which necessitates a lot of fundamental changes on the, in the manufacturing facilities. And so the, their original plan was that they were going to put together a small team of a SWAT team-like approach they were going to train these people in the lean approach very heavily, and then the small team was going to fly to every manufacturing facility around the world, spend three months there transforming the facility, and then fly on to the next one. And that was my point to them, that that's kind of like the old joke about consultants, is that we swoop in, eat your food, poop on you, and fly away. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. exactly. And that is not how we make change. It's like somebody coming into your house and rearranging the furniture and thinking that that's going even if it's going to make things more efficient and a better flow, it's still your house and it doesn't work that way. Oh, okay. And, and therefore, the, I guess the emotional aspect of change. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's why, what do we hear so much? Uh, Most of the change management literature is about overcoming resistance to change. And so often that we do drop out that, um, that what looks like resistance is that people have a lot of ownership getting back to the gang analogy, about the way things are and a lot of comfort with it and they help build it. And when you come in and don't build that relationship, don't explain the why, don't overcome there or deal with, you know, kind of, I always talk about resistance as resistance is an organization, um, is like an immune system, right? We have an immune system in our body that protects us from harm, from invaders from the outside. And that's what happens in companies, that there's all these, whether it's procedures and policies or it's people's behaviors or it's norms, whatever it is, there's a whole immune system in organizations that will resist change. And if we don't understand that and proactively deal with it, and we think we can come in with some head only kind of top down intellectual approach no matter how smart it is it's not going to work yeah 
And uh, sometimes, uh, too, there is an already established business that has a name. I know my cousin's a professional photographer, and when he wanted to go out on his own, he, there was a photography studio that was selling their studio. So he bought the studio, and he didn't change the name because that studio studio had already built up a reputation on that name, and he felt if he would change the name, that it would be just like starting all over again, and the previous clients wouldn't come to him. And that's a really good point, too, and that's one of the challenges in mergers and acquisitions, is how much do you make the, the names, the business model, the cultures, the processes, the systems consistent, and how much do you allow for local variation for lots of different reasons, including one that you just talked about, customer loyalty um, and expectations and experience. Well, you know what they say? They say the only thing that never changes is the fact that everything changes. Right, <laughs> right. exactly. Uh, exactly. So that's what, exactly. We, that's what we have to live with. And if you are in, in charge of yourself, your family, your business, uh, or maybe you're an elected official and you've got the whole country at, at your hands, uh, Change Intelligence is going to help you. The book, I mean. Uh, I have a copy of Barbara's book. If you would like it, call me up. I'll be glad to leave it for you with your name on it. And if you change your name, we'll still accept that. And, and, <laughs> that's right. And, uh, and, the, and then we also need to know how to go buy the book. Uh, Barbara, how do we do that? Do you have a website? Yes. Uh, my website is www.changecatalystswithans.com. Okay. Okay. And it's also available um, on Amazon. Okay, changecatalysts.com. I see that Robin already has that on the WOCA website, so go to WOCA.com if you couldn't write that down. Look at the guest list for AML Cal Live for today, and you'll see Barbara's name at the 1035 slot with that address, uh, changecatalysts.com, on it. Uh, Change Intelligence, again, the name of the book, Barbara A. Troutline, Dr. Barbara Troutline. Thank you so much for being with us today. Fun interview. Thank you. Thank you, Larry and Robin. We'll take a little break and be right back. We're listening <laughs> to WOCA News Talk 1370, Ocala's source for what's happening in today's hottest up-to-date news and topics. Right now, somewhere in the world, there is a bear waking up from a long winter's hibernation. <laughs> Scientists are not 100% sure how a bear knows winter is over, but I think I may have an explanation. Here it is. Spring comes to Florida first, so Florida gardeners get that spring fever first and head over to Kenny's Place Nursery. They go to Kenny's Place for gazanias and patients, geraniums and begonias, all for 99 cents each. They also head to Kenny's Place Nursery for pansies, selling for four for a dollar. Now. That is a honey of a deal. Well, the thought of the honey reminds those gardeners of the special role pollinators, like bees, have in the garden. Now, every bear knows that where there are bees, there is honey. So, their noses wiggle, their ears twitch, and boom, the bear wakes up. And all because of a great sale at Kenny's Place Nursery. Who knew? Kenny's Place Nursery is located at 7677 Southeast 41st Court in Ocala. Give them a call at 867-1213. It's a honey of a deal at Kenny's Place. Mark your calendars for Saturday, April 6th for the Francis Marion Military Academy Spring Fling at the Ocala Shrine Club on Mary Camp Road. Join the first annual Swamp Fox Chili Cook-Off and Classic Car Show. Take a chance on winning one of five different late model vehicles for the unbelievably low price of just $20 per ticket. Only 5,000 tickets will be sold. The proceeds benefit the Francis Marion Military Academy. Businesses, organizations, and talented individuals are invited to show off their cooking skills and to compete for the best tasting chili. Go to Swamp Fox of events.com for the registration directions to the Shrine Club, Car Show, Chili Cook-Off. Join our sponsors in supporting the Academy. Remember that Saturday, April 6th for the Francis Mary Military Academy Spring Fling at the Ocala Shrine Club on Mary Camp Road. The first annual Swamp Fox Chili Cook-Off and Classic Car Show. For more information call Charlie at 843-7790. That's 843-7790. 843-7790. Or visit SwampFoxEvents.com. On the next Voice of Ocala, it's Community Gazette Day, live from Gateway Bank. It's also Ask the Cops. It's your chance to call in and ask Chief Greg Graham of the Ocala Police Department or Sheriff Chris Blair of the Marion County Sheriff's Office any questions you might have about community policing in our area. Also, we'll bring you up to date on all the bracket stuff going on with the NCAA. It's not looking real good for some of the team here at the Voice of Ocala. We'll tell you who that is. All that next.